recording. Well, the important announcement is that quiz one will be on February 8th and February 8th is actually a Monday. So you will have done three assignments by that time. And so the contents of the quiz would be uh, the contents from all the three assignments that you would have seen before quiz one uh, on February 8th. So that's the first important announcement. Uh, what I will do is quiz one will be on Carmen, so it will be automatically graded. So what I'll do is I'll upload the quiz on Carmen. And once you open Carmen webpage on uh, February 8th at class time around 1.50 PM, uh, you would uh, you would find that quiz and so you will have to take the quiz during the class time and you will have to finish it off, submit all your answers by 2.45 p.m. Um, so that's how quiz one will be conducted. Any questions on quiz one? Will it be multiple choice or? Yeah, multiple choice, yeah. Okay. No descriptive questions. It's like, you know, you just click a button or it could be multiple answers questions. It could be a single answer question, so but it will be multiple choice type questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you will need a paper and pen. So I'll ask you to say, do some calculations on the paper and whatever is the answer, you basically pick one from the multiple choice answers. Okay, um, let's get started with today's lecture. So we have finished uh, chapter one and in chapter one, we talked about chapter one of the book and we talked about exponential signals, impulse and uh, unit step functions. And then we talked about various properties of systems. Um, what I want to remind from lecture three is the sampling for today's lecture. What I want to remind from lecture three is the sampling property of unit impulse. So remember, we were talking about this sampling property that when you multiply a signal with a unit step, uh, unit uh, impulse function at t minus t naught, you get the value of that signal at t naught and then the impulse at uh, t minus t naught. The same, this, this is the continuous time. So this is the continuous time uh, sampling property. And then we had a discrete time sampling property, which was, this is the discrete time sampling property, which is x of n delta n minus n naught. So this is the impulse function at n minus n naught is x of n naught delta n minus n naught. So this is the most important, one of the important things we should remember from lecture three. And let's write it down for our memory. Okay, this is the sampling property. Okay, in the previous lecture, we talked about LTI systems, linear time invariant systems. And for the linear systems, we realize that it satisfies superposition property. And the time invariant part, it implies that if the input is x of t minus t naught, then the output would be y of T minus T naught. So if you translate the input along the time axis, the output will also get trans translated accordingly. That's the time. That's the time invariance part. Okay, so I want to re recall these two concepts from chapter one, and we are starting in chapter two. So the key insight that 
we will be discussing in today's class and we will do the derivations is any signal can be decomposed into superposition of impulse signal okay this is the first insight and this insight actually comes from the sampling property and we will do the derivation so you will exactly see what i'm talking about in a few seconds <clears throat> So the first part of the lecture is we will show that any signal, no matter what signal you pick, it can be decomposed into superposition of impulse signals. Typically, this superposition could be an infinite series of impulse signal. Okay, that's the first insight, first part of the lecture. The second part of the lecture is we will consider LTI system and if we know the impulse response of LDI system, then we can compute compute the response to any signal. Any input signal. Okay, and the second insight would be a consequence of insight number one. And the fact that we are considering a linear system which satisfies superposition property and a time invariant system which satisfies this translation property we just talked about. Okay, so all of these three things are gonna to come together in proving this particular result, uh, insight number two, um, which forms the basis of much of what we are going to discuss in this class and in subsequent classes in signal processing as well as in control systems. Okay, so let's dive into the details. Okay. So let's say I have a signal. So let's consider the discrete time case. I have an input signal Xn and my goal is to compute the output signal Yn with respect to this input. So the first thing I'm going to do is, I know that Xn of delta N minus K is given by Xk delta N minus K. So let's say I have a signal, this is my time N I can write it as
Okay, so I have this signal X, Xn. I can write it as a sum of two signals where you have uh, this magnitude at K1 and this magnitude at K2. So in fact, this argument can be made for any signal X. And we can in fact say the following, we can make the following assertion, Xn can be written as summation K equals minus infinity to infinity xk delta n minus k. So what have we done? We, we wrote X, so we can write Xn as infinite sum of Xk. This is just a magnitude. And this is the impulse, impulse signal. Okay, so I multiply the impulse signal by certain ma magnitude. And of course, this impulse signal is getting translated as an in with index k. And so I take an infinite series of k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of this infinite sum. And so xn, which is a signal, is decomposed as a weighted sum of impulse signal. Okay, any questions so far? I'm going to pause here for a bit to take any questions. This, this is the first important concept in this class. And I want you all to understand it clearly before we proceed. Okay, no questions. All right, so I have, I started with this signal. I want to figure out what the output Yn is uh, in for through this discrete time system. So the first step that I did was I decomposed this Xn into a sum of impulse signal. Okay, now I'm going to assume that the system is linear time invariant. Okay. So let's recall the first part. Let's say my input signal is delta n minus k to a time. Oh, uh, 
let's first if the input is delta n and i have a time invariant system let's say the output is given by hn so this is called the impulse response of the system so this is the response of the system with respect to an impulse input Now let's assume that I'm going to translate this delta n. So remember, I have this, the original signal xn is decomposed into impulse signals that are all shifted in time. So if I give it the input delta n minus k and I have a time invariant system, what would the impulse response, what not the impulse response, but what would the response of the system be? Can someone write in the chat window or maybe unmute yourself and say what the output would it be H would the, would the uh, response be um, H of N minus K? Yeah, perfect. So because this is a time invariant system, the response is gonna be H of N minus K. Okay, now I, so, so the TI part has been taken care of. So I, I give it an input. I have a question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so I know I answered this right, but now I'm confused because when I'm looking at the notes previously, when we had our, our time invariant system of X of N times Delta N minus K, we had our um, X of N times the Delta N minus K. So when we have um, the system here with, with our input of um, Delta N, um why don't we have delta n um or i'm not sorry i'm sorry uh not not delta n delta k times delta n minus k no so you mean xk multiplied by delta n minus k is this what you're talking about yeah why why aren't we doing something similar like that to the time invariant system we'll, right there? yeah so we'll get to it in a bit so time invariant doesn't allow you to scale the system that comes from the linearity part, not from the time invariant part. So let's go back to section uh, okay. five. Uh, the definition of time invariant system was that if the input is xt, the output is yt. If the input is xt minus t naught, the output will also be like translated with minus t naught. So the output will be yt or t minus t naught. So we are using the same idea here. The input is delta n minus k. The output will be y of n minus k. That's what we are using. Okay. That's the time invariance part. All right. Okay, great. Now I am going to give it an input xk. So now I'm going to scale the input xk delta n minus k. I have LTI system. So now I have added linearity. I, I have included one more assumption here of linearity. Now remember, because of the homogeneity property, my output is going to be xk h of n minus k. Remember the LTI system, linear uh, system satisfies this property of homogeneity. So if you scale the input, the output will also be scaled appropriately. All right, so now I'm going to do the summation over all K. So I have the LTI system 
and I do the summation, k goes from minus infinity to infinity, xk delta n minus k, what is the output going to be? So remember LDI system satisfies additivity property also. Would that just be XN? Sorry, can you speak a little louder? Uh, would that just be XN? Yeah, this is XN on this side. What is the output of the system? Y, YN. Right, so what is YN yeah. going to be equal to? The so summation. Have, yeah, summation. Of K equals negative infinity to infinity. Would it be X K delta of, sorry, H of N minus K. Perfect, yes, that's right. So because of the additivity property, if you add two signals, the output is going to be the addition of two outputs. So I have the individual signals as X. Let me, no. I wanted a laser pointer. Oh, doesn't matter. So if my input is, input is this, my output is this. Now I'm going to add, uh, you know, infinite number of such inputs. And I know because of the additivity property of the LTI system, my output will also be the infinite sum of the corresponding outputs, okay? And so that gives us, as you can see, going through this series of derivations, um, what we have done is for LTI systems, we have proven that if you give it an input Xn, the output is going to be given by this expression. Okay, so you can see the entire four steps in succession. And I'll pause here for any questions. This is the second most important thing you will ever learn in signals and systems. The first important thing was the decomposition of signal. Okay, no questions. So what we have proven in fact is the following fact that Yn is written as a series of xk times the impulse response at n minus k. And this is written in short form as x convolution h evaluated at n or xn convolution hn. So both of these are, uh, so this is the notation adopted in book, xn uh, convoluted with hn, but the correct mathematical notation is x convolution with h evaluated at n um, I mean, I don't care which notation you use in your assignments, but if someone who knows mathematics reads your paper or re reads your report, they're gonna be extremely confused if you use this notation. So this notation is the correct mathematical notation. This is the notation we have in the book. I don't know for why, why they picked such a notation for convolution, but that's what we have in the book. So don't get confused if I write X convolution H evaluated at N because that's the right mathematical notation. It's the same thing as what's given in the book. Has anyone seen this before? Was it covered in 2050, the convolution thing? 
Yeah, uh, Wilson was kind of covered in 2020, or not 2020, um, uh, 2050. It was more of a, uh, here's what you're going to do, here's a cheat sheet for it, and then they move I see, it. I see, I see, okay. We modeled it in MATLAB too. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, that's fine. So here is the derivation of this convolution equation where it comes from. So we used a lot of different things. The first thing we used to get there was the fact that we recognized any signal can be viewed as decomposition of impulse signal. And then we used the properties of time invariant uh, linear systems or linear time invariant systems to derive the convolution equation. So the, the, the most important or rather the most beautiful aspect of this particular equation is once you know the impulse, once you know the impulse output of a system of a LTI system, you can literally do the convolution operation and you can get the output for any input or input to the system X for any input, because any input can be decomposed and then you just have to convolve the input with the impulse response and you get the output of the system. And this is perhaps the most important observation in the signals and systems theory literature. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's do an example. So I have an accumulator, the system is an accumulator. And so you give it an input delta N, you get an output U of N. So this is the impulse input and you get a step response. Uh, step, uh, not a step response, it's a step. The output is a step, the input is impulse. And I, as, as you remember, a real life example of an accumulator is a switch. You give it an impulse input, you turn it on and the switch remains on until you turn it off again, right? So that's an accumulator. It integrates your input. Okay. Now I'm going to give this accumulator an input. So the input to the system is going to be alpha raised to N. So a decaying exponential U of N. So this is equivalent to saying this is alpha raised to n for n greater than or equal to zero, it's zero for n less than zero. So the input looks like this. That's a decaying exponential. Now the question is, we have an integrator or we have an accumulator and we give it an input, which is a decaying exponential after time any greater than or equal to zero. So it's a decaying exponential, but it starts only after time zero. Uh, what's the output? What's the response is, what's the response to the system is going to be? And of course, if you, if you had to do it without using the convolution, it would be a very, very complicated process. But because we know that an accumulator is a linear time invariant system, I could use the convolution function to find the response. So this implies that my yn is x convolution hn. 
now the question is how do we evaluate this convolution and uh, of course by if through assignments you will get to do some of these convolutions so you will kind of know how the convolution works but what i'm going to do is i'll just sort of broadly outline what are the steps uh, but it requires quite a bit of intuition so that's why i think uh, the more you do it the better you understand this whole idea of convolution so for n less than equal to or less, let's say we are going to first consider the case where n is less than 0 So let's look at x of k h n minus k. So I've picked an n which is less than zero. And so I can have k less than zero or I could have k greater than or equal to zero. So what happens when k is less than zero? What's the value of x k? for k less than zero, let's go and look at it. So when n is less than zero, the value of xn is zero. So this is going to be zero because for k less than zero, xk is less than zero. Now let's consider the case when k is greater than or equal to zero. Remember my n is strictly less than zero. So my h of n minus k is going to be, so n minus k is strictly less than zero because my n is less than zero and k is non-negative. And what do I know about h for values of time less than zero? Well, that is equal to zero. So even though xk is positive, h of n minus k is zero, so therefore, for k greater than or equal to zero, the multiplication is equal to zero. questions okay now let's look at the same thing for n greater than 0 or greater than equal to 0 i want to compute xk h n minus k now here I will I will have three sep three separations. So k less than zero, zero less than equal to k less than equal to n, and k greater than n. Why should we have these three situations? I mean, it just comes from practice. So the more you practice, the better you will be able to do this convolution. Okay, so let's look at k less than zero. What's the value of xk? xk for k less than zero is equal to zero. So I'll put a zero here. What about k greater than n? So I know that xk is positive, but h of n minus k, so n minus k would become negative when k is greater than n. And h is a unit step function, so therefore h of n minus k will be zero. So for k greater than n, the multiplication of these two variables or these two quantities is going to be equal to zero. 
Now I want you to think about what happens when zero is less than equal to K is less than equal to N and tell me what should I fill in that particular block? You should have a one there. One, why, why should it be one? Because I thought with unit step functions, the output is either a zero or a one. Right, but it's zero, uh, zero until, until you hit time zero and then at time zero and later it's equal to one. Right, it... so K is, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Right, so this is equal to one for this zero. Okay, somebody else was saying something. Yeah, sorry, would it be alpha to the K? Right, so this would be alpha raised to K. So yeah, your XK is alpha raised to K for K greater than or equal to zero. And H of N minus K is equal to one in this particular region. So this is alpha raised to K. Okay, any questions on the case n greater than or equal to zero? Okay, so now the only thing that is left is I now have to do this infinite sum, which is um, all the way from, for every value of n, I have to sum it from k equals minus infinity to plus infinity. So let's do that now. So I have Sorry, this is a lot. It's very tedious, but it will become easier as time progresses. So this is equal to zero for n less than zero. So let's look at the case when n is less than zero. So when n is less than zero, uh, no matter what value of k you pick, the multiplication of these two terms is equal to zero. So the infinite sum is going to be equal to zero. Now for the case when n is greater than or equal to zero, I need to add this, this whole, I need to add this whole block here for all values of k. So for k going all the way to minus infinity to zero, uh, the sum is equal to zero. For k greater than n, the sum is equal to zero. So I am only left with k equals zero to n alpha raised to k. This is what the response of the system is going to look like. I want to simplify it even further. So what I'm going to do is I will write it as uh, this sum can be written as one minus alpha raised to n plus one over one minus alpha. And then u of n, which basically means that for n less than, e less than zero, it's equal to zero. And for n greater than equal to zero, this part will be equal to one. And so this is what you would write if you wanted to write in your answer sheet, this is what the response looks like. It's just a convention to not leave the response in this state and actually write it in this form. It's just a convention and we'll just follow that convention throughout the course.
Okay, I'm going to pause here for questions. How did you simplify it? Oh, so this summation, okay, so this summation, k equals zero to n alpha raised to k is one minus alpha raised to n plus one over one minus alpha. That's just sum of geometric series. And, and then if you look at this expression for n less than zero, the you have zero signal. So what you do is you have this, uh, this sum of geometric series, one minus alpha raised to n plus one over one minus alpha. You multiply this by a unit step function, un, and that gives you exactly this expression. The expression- Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So are we going to have to go through this process every time we're solving for a convolution or can we use what you just did, like the solution to what you just did? So um, to simplify it and speed it up. Right. So, so you have to, so if you have to do convolution, at least for maybe the current assignment, assignment two or assignment three, you probably will have to go through this entire step and you will have to compute the final expression and write it in this format this format. Speaking of assignment two, yeah. I can't find it on Carmen. Uh, I'll be uploading it after the class. So by evening, maybe 5 p.m. or 5.30 p.m., you should see your assignment two on Carmen. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you explain one more time how you got that summation in blue where when n is greater than or equal to zero, you have the summation of k equals zero to n alpha to the k? Oh, this part? Right. Yes. Yeah. So, How did you yeah. get that again? Right. So for n greater than or equal to zero. So see, this is the case n great. This is the case n greater than or equal to zero, right? So I have mm -hmm. to sum yeah. over k equals minus infinity to infinity. So basically I'll have to sum this whole thing. Zero, alpha raised to k and zero. So okay. for k minus infinity to zero, the sum is equal to zero. For k greater than n, so k from n plus one to infinity, the summation is zero. And for k equals zero to n, the summation is k equals zero to n alpha raised to k. Got it, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Uh, let's go back to the basics. So what we did was we decomposed a signal, the input signal into sum of impulse signals. Then we used the property of LTI signal, uh, LTI system to show that the output is actually going to be the sum of the weighted sum of the uh, impulse response of the system, which could be compactly written as convolution between the input and the impulse response. And then for this particular example, uh, which is accumulator with a decaying exponential input. Uh, we use the usual convolution equation and some complicated mumbo jumbo to derive the output signal Y of N. Um, you can see that the entire process is very, very tedious of computing the convolution, but in maybe 10 or 15 lectures later, we will realize that this whole thing can be done much in a much more simplified fashion uh, using the, what is known as Fourier transform and Laplace transform, the theory of Fourier transform and Laplace transform. So we'll get to it in about 10 to 15 lectures later. Okay, but until then, we'll have to go through this tedious way of computing convolution. All right, let's move on to the continuous time. So the discrete time was easy to understand. Uh, continuous time is only slightly more difficult to understand. So in the continuous time system, I have an input signal. This is my X, T, and T. Let's say this is what my input signal looks like. And just like you may have done it in your calculus class, I'm going to divide the signal into a 
into small square, sorry, rectangular signals. Something like this. And so this width is actually equal to delta. So this is a way to approximate the original signal. So original signal is a continuous time signal. And I'm going to use this small length uh, time delta. So I'm going to divide the time into small intervals of length delta. So I have, this is my K delta, this is my K plus one delta. And I will write an approximate signal XT, which is an approximation to XT. And it can be written as summation So this X hat T would be this signal. This gray signal that you see on the screen, this is my X hat T. So this X hat T is sort of closely approximating the continuous time signal X of T. But the cool thing about X hat T is it is piecewise constant signal. So from K delta to K plus one delta, the value of the signal is X of K delta multiplied by one over delta multiplied by delta. Okay, so I can write my X hat T as this infinite sum of this delta function multiplied by delta multiplied by the value of original signal X at K delta. It's of course pretty obvious to you that as delta goes to zero, let me write it as X hat delta so that I'm a bit more clear. As delta goes to zero, X hat delta T converges to X of T. Because these intervals are gonna become smaller and smaller and it will approximate X of T exactly. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so in particular, I can write X of T. Now, if you take Delta goes to zero, this part, if you look at this part, this is infinite summation with a step size Delta. So by the theory of Riemann integral, which you may have studied in your math class, in your calculus class, it can be written as an integral of minus infinity to infinity x of tau delta t minus tau d tau. That's just from calculus.
This is known as Riemann integration. So it turns out, so here is the step. So I started with a continuous time signal X of T. Uh, I approximated it with a piecewise constant signal X hat of delta T. I've learned that as I take delta goes to zero, turns out that X hat delta T will converge to X of T. And X of T can be written as an integral of X of tau delta T minus tau D tau. Now, I, but this is not what I'm interested in. So what I've done so far is I have, I have decomposed a signal X of T into, in this case, not an infinite sum, but an integral of impulse, weighted impulse uh, inputs. But I'm interested in the output of the system. So I want to know if I give the input X of T through an LTI system, what is my output y of t going to be? This is what I'm interested in. And the problem is in the case of discrete time system, I could just use the summation and I could get beautiful equation. But in the case of continuous time system, now I have this integral, like ugly integral equation with delta functions and whatnot. So how do I get the expression for y t? So what we are going to do is, we will give it an input x hat of delta t, which is actually much more benign because it's an infinite sum of piecewise constant signal. And I'm going to compute y hat delta i of t, and then I'm going to let delta go to zero on both the side of this LTI system. And that way I will recover the output yt of the system with input x of t. Okay, so that's our roadmap for what we are going to do. Any questions so far? You know, I, uh, I just have one minute left. So let me just do it very quickly. And then I'll spend a little bit more time in the next class. So this is summation of X K Delta So by the property of linear and time invariance, what I will have is summation X K delta H delta K T minus T minus K delta delta K equals minus infinity to infinity. So this is my y hat delta t. Now I have to let delta go to zero, which would imply that my y hat delta t, this converges to integral minus infinity to infinity x t x tau h of t minus tau d tau. Okay, so this is the impulse response of the system. This is the impulse response of the system. This is the input to the system. And now again, the 
output of the system can be characterized by the impulse response of the system and the input to the system in this integral fashion. And it turns out that this integral is exactly the convolution function or the convolution operation between the impulse response and the input in a continuous time system. So that's all I have for today. Uh, we will spend a little bit more time on this particular convolution equation in the next class, do an example, and then we will talk about properties of convolution and properties of LTI systems. Okay, so thank you for your attention. I'm going to hang around after stopping the recording. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask.